So today's webinar is uh, is about finding and using publicly available data. So it's our e-learning collection, and uh, most of the questions will be based upon uh, this collection. Uh, but before we go into that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, um, a few um, resources from uh, from Embel EBI. So Embel EBI has uh, a huge variety um, of resources and databases, as you can see on this slide. Uh, so all these resources have been sorted out into different categories. So if you are interested in uh, chemical molecules or small drug molecules, you can uh, always refer to KB, Campbell, metabolites kind of resources. If you're interested in genes and genomes uh, and RNA, you can look into AirExpress, Ensemble, ENA, Express, Expression Atlas, etc. Uh, and similarly, we have uh, resources for proteins, um, imaging and cellular structures, uh, genetic variation and disease data, uh, for example, EVA and EGA, and we have uh, uh, in our panel two representation uh, one from, from EGA and EVA. And uh, then we have uh, resources on uh, literature and uh, knowledge management. And, and so for all these, if you, uh, you can see this is our services page, and this is where all the um, databases and resources uh, are maintained. And if you are interested in particular bioinformatics tool or resource, you can always uh, search from them here using the search box. Uh, if you go to services page, and you will find uh, your resource or database of interest. And if you are interested in, in, uh, in training, you want to get training on specific topic or resource, how to use uh, a bioinformatic tool, you can always go to our uh, training webpage and you can use this search box to uh, type in your topic of interest and uh, find the training materials that you're interested. It could be uh, a live training where where it's a live event, uh, like a on-site course or off-site course or virtual course, uh, and also webinars like the one which you have joined in uh, now. And there are loads of materials available on our on-demand training, uh, where you can learn things at your own pace uh, in, in your own time. OK, uh, so this is the e-learning collection. Uh, which is the main focus for the Q&A session today, is finding and using publicly available data. So if you go to this, uh, um, this tutorial, you will find uh, different chapters uh, where the main theme is uh, how you can find publicly available data, how you can use publicly available data, what is open data, and how you can use public uh, data in your own research, how you can share your data, how you can submit your data, et cetera. But uh, just to let you know, the questions which uh, we'll focus on today, the main topics uh, for these questions will be data sharing and submission, uh, restrict restricted access to genetic and phenotypic and clinical data, uh, general uh, data management of biological data and open data, and also how you can find the right EMBL EBI uh, resource for accessing data uh, of your interest. So with that, I will uh, introduce our panel. So today we have in our panel, uh, Marcos Casado Barbero, who is uh, uh, a metadata bioinformatician uh, for EGA. And then we have Baron Collis, who is bioinformatician uh, in EVA team. And we have Deani Araujo, who is scientific training officer in the training team. So with that, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, I'll I'll let the uh, panelists introduce themselves. I'll start with Marcus. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. I have a few slides prepared for this presentation. Um, can you see my screen? Okay. So um, just to introduce myself and a little bit, the team that I work for, uh, which is the European Genome Phenome Archive, or EGA with the acronym. Um, so just like uh, AJ introduced myself, um, my name is Marcos Casalo Barbero, and I work as a metadata bioinformatician for the EGA. And the EGA, just like its name implies, it's a phenome clinical and genomic archive of human data. 
It was launched in 2008 by DBI, and currently, since 2012, we collaborate with uh, COG in Barcelona. So it's like uh, two groups uh, mixed in one. What makes EGA different? Um, most of these resources were already introduced by AJ, but uh, these are examples of public archives. And by public, I mean that you can access it without controlled access, because on the other side of the coin, where we are as the EGA, there are the controlled access um, data archives, which means that even though all of us are subject to the GDPR uh, laws, the, the ones that work with sensitive information, and we are one of them, have more stringent uh, measures of access and require more auditing regarding the access that um, all of the users have uh, to the data. So I don't want to overextend this presentation. So uh, you can check uh, another webinar that we have uh, revolving around this topic uh, here, working sensitive data at the EDI. And this also means that we have an extra layer on top of the normal workflow. This is the normal workflow of the EGA. I'm not going to get into the details. I just want to show that we have on top of the on top of the layers regarding the data archival and the data distribution, uh, etc. We have agreements between the providers of the data and the users, the data controllers and the uh, processors, which is the EGA, the processors and the um, users. So it's uh, sometimes overcomplicated because we have to follow the, the, the laws, in, especially in Europe, and the laws that uh, the EDI is subject to. And just to finalize this uh, short introduction, the EGA team, as I said, it's a mixture between the CRG and the EDI, so it's not only EDI in, in the UK. And we are founded by both the external and internal projects. And besides, we are expanding, uh, good news, because the EGA is launching the federated EGA, which means that multiple nodes will be growing all over the place and doing something similar with, as the original EGA. And I think that's, that's going to be it. I didn't want to overextend this. Hi. So I'm Baron Cordes. Welcome, everyone. Um, I think I'll do the same thing and share my screen because there's a couple of short slides to sort of highlight what I work on and the group I work within. So I'm hoping everyone can see the European Variation Archive screen. Excellent. So just to reiterate, my name is Baron Cordes, <clears throat> and I work as a bioinformatician at the European Variation Archive which as we go through the slides, you'll see is essentially an open access resource for genetic variation data from all species. Um, if it goes forward, my keyboard sometimes plays up when I'm on Zoom for some reason, but uh, just to give you a brief um, introduction to the actual resource itself, um, because we also interact with other resources at the EBI. So you also see how we exchange data, share data and add data to sort of add value to um, other resources data as well as they do the same thing for us as well. So just an introduction to the EBI. Um, it's a home for biological data services, research and training, and it's part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. What we do as the EVA is we act as a fair data resource um, where our main role is the responsibility of permanent storage and accessioning of genetic variation data from any species. When we do this work, we essentially act as a fair data resource in that we assign these globally unique and persistent queryable variant identifiers. So as you'll see, we assign variants that are submitted to us SS and RSIDs you may have come across if you're sort of going through a publication. And um, the research that you're interested in has said, well, I'm looking at this particular variant and it has this RSID. You should then be able to query the RSID within our database or another database such as Ensemble or NCBI, and you should be able to find the same information. We also ensure that the data is accessible, um, it's universally accessible, and the data is open and free to access. The data is also interoperable. Um, the reference data in itself is in a format that can be used and is recognized and has some standardization. In this case, we accept data in the variant call format, the VCF format, well, the VCF. 
and the data itself is reusable in that the metadata, the associated metadata we archive with the data ensures that the data someone else is consuming or downloading, you know how the data was generated and you can do almost the same type of analysis to generate the same type of data. I'm clicking and pressing the arrow on my keyboard. Sorry, I do apologize if I'm skipping slides ahead. Um, you saw this slide earlier within the presentation. So we just reside here in the genetic variation and disease cluster under the European Variation Archive. And just to give you a brief idea of the numbers we have at the moment, we currently house around 3.4 billion variants across 227 species. We archive the variant information, um, the associated metadata information, sort of the experiment and the description of the pipeline used to generate the data. And we also provide some additional information um, I mentioned that our main role is the archival of this data, but we also add um, this sort of value to the data that we're archiving. So we run Ensemble's variant effect predictor tool, and that provides the effect on genes and transcripts, the functional consequence of the variant itself, and some information on population frequencies per study. And this is just a general overview of the pipeline used of how data gets into us. So it comes the submitter, which is you, hopefully, submits us VCF files with the associated metadata. That comes through to a help desk where we run the data validation pipeline. Um, you may have questions about this as we go through. This ensures that the format of the data is correct. And then we provide the user back with this unique project identifier and analysis identifier. And just some of our funding bodies, as well as the team that works on the EVA. And thank you for listening to the slides. And I'll, from here, I'll do the same thing and try to stop my sharing of the screen and pass it on. Ah, perfect. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ben. So next, uh, Diani. Hi, everyone. I don't have slides to share. Uh, I'm Diana Raujo. So I work at the Envoy BI training team. So working on development and also delivery of a range of bioinformatics focused courses and also range of data management uh, uh, training as well. So yeah, I hope I can help um, you today with your um, questions. Yeah, that's it. That was a short one. Right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for introducing yourself and your resource. Uh, so now we start our uh, Q&A session. Uh, so in this session, first, we will start with some general questions and, and specific questions which were already submitted uh, during registration uh, by you. Uh, and then we also take some questions which are coming in uh, in, in uh, Q&A box. Okay, so we start with, uh, so because we are talking about uh, publicly available data, so I think the very first step is someone is submitting uh, their research data. So we got one interesting question, um, and uh, and I'll go, uh, Marcus, to you uh, to start with. So somebody is asking, why should I submit my data to any database, and uh, how is it going to help my own research? Yeah, that's uh, very, just like you said, that's a very interesting question and very common. Um, the, well, the, the, the value in submitting your data to an archive is incredible. Uh, it has like multiple dimensions that it can help your, your own research. Um, but there are a few that come to mind um, that I would like to highlight. So the first one is the value of open science for data and for science, uh, which means that we wouldn't be here if it wasn't like, it, it kind of sounds altruistic, but it wouldn't, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't because of open science. So that's the first one. I would also, in more um, selfish way, we could highlight the grants. Uh, I don't request grants myself, but I've seen many grants applications that do require your data to be accessible after you have finished your um, your research, which means that you eventually will have to submit it to one of uh, the open archives that we have, um, which means that you have more accessibility to other brands. And I I guess that's something that um, 
benefits your own research. Another one could be the visibility of your topic. So for instance, if I am interested in, um, I don't know, I am doing research regarding diabetic, uh, diabetic in kids or uh, diabetes in childhood, and that's a very specific topic, and there are not many researchers um, that do research about that. And I want to draw attention to that topic. The easiest way is to share my, my research with others and then make them interested in my topic, which will, will in the long run, benefit uh, my own research. Another one could be the, and it's related to the previous one, could be the impact of your team in your field. If you don't submit your data to any open archive, but you say that your data is this and that, um, normally that's not as trusted and open as we would like. Uh, EBI and MBOL EBI um, is always an advocate for open science for, for a reason. And the impact of your team changes dramatically if some other people can replicate what you, what you did in the past. Um, another one, again, related to the previous one, could be the credibility and overall transparency of your research. Just like I described, people won't believe what you say unless you prove it. Uh, and, unless you prove it. and finally, I would say the permanent archival. So this one is very common. Um, if I submit my data to the EGA, for instance, or any other archive, it's permanent, as in the sense that I will probably die and the data will still be there. And if I finish my research in five years, and we've always heard about these cases in which some, some people five years later, they request you, oh, uh, can you share this data that you did some research about five years ago? And you're like, oops, it's in the cluster of my institution. I no longer work there, or it was in one of the computers that we were using, but uh, we don't know where it is or things like that. So if you share your data and you submit your data to one of our archives, it's very useful because you, for you to, um, for you to distribute it in the future, it's as simple as simple as you uh, sharing a link or an identifier, and with the rest, which is very uh, handy for you. Um, I'm sure I'm sure other panelists can can think of many other reasons, but these are the ones that I would probably highlight uh, in this case. No, I think it's the same. Thing sort of a uh, just to um provide a backup on Marcus's point in that um especially here at the EVA we're finding if you are going to submit a manuscript um this is an example of the frontiers of genetics this journal does this at the moment where uh, if you are submitting your manuscript directly to them they also request the raw data to be available in an open access database and so you'll find that um at the EVA we receive loads of submitters who have come over and said, well, I need to submit this data. Can you help me? And um, when we provide that unique project accession, they provide that back to the journals. And then the journals use that as confirmation that the raw data is available in an open access resource. And then yeah, the publication that can then go forward with the acceptance. Great. Thanks, Marcus and Ver. So next question is, uh, is, is kind of next step. Uh, so People are submitting data, but the data is coming from so many different labs, different sequencing platforms, uh, and you have to put this data in your uh, in your database. So the question is, uh, uh, I'll start with Baron from you. Uh, do you perform any batch correction to make it consistent, and how how you do it? So we do provide correction to an extent um not on the actual integrity of the data itself but uh, we ensure that the format of the data is correct in that it abides by the vcf specification reason being is that um once the data does abide by vcf specification it can then be used by other resources or used by other researchers for further analysis and they hopefully won't bump into any problems what we're hoping for is that the tools, there's many, many different tools and software that are used in bioinformatics that um, have different standards. So by ensuring that all the data we're receiving and distributing abides by all the same standards, then all the same tools and softwares should be able to work with them with uh, minimal problems. So that's one of the things that we sort of provide in that sort of validation sense. 
Um, we also ensure that the way the data is generated, that the reference alleles can map back to um, a reference genome or sequence that has also been distributed in an open access database. And then we also ensure things, um, sort of uh, minor things in regards to the analysis itself, such as if the sample names are matching between the metadata and the variant data, and um, anything that allows the submitter to have a um, sort of an open text where they can just input any sort of data. We'd have to double check that. But in regards to the data itself, um, an example I like to use is that um, many of the time we receive a VCF file which hasn't been filtered. And so that file contains um, variants that are sort of low quality variants or Sometimes we receive a VCF file where it's a, there's a variant entry, but for each sample within that analysis, um, each sample has been highlighted as homozygous reference. So it's not highlighting that a variant has been found within that analysis, it's just highlighting the entry of a variant. With that being said, we have to archive the data as it stands, but um, when it comes to sort of providing a new unique identifier, that variant entry will miss out because it's not actually a variant. It's just sort of text within a VCF file. It's just text within a line. So these tools that we use to do this are made available. But um, yeah, in, in regards, there's only so much we can um, do with the data itself. We can't handle data in a sense of we can't tell the researchers with what research they're doing. We still have to just act as an archive, um, open access archive. Yeah, thank you. Marcus? Yeah, um, just like Baron said, we we do not check with, within the data too much because we we are data controllers, we are not data owners. So at the, at the very least for the EGA case, we do not modify what it's given to us. What we do is check before we accept it that it's in the correct format and some checks regarding metadata or but the data integrity is not one of the main pillars in our uh, data validation. We do check that the combination of files is correct and that the file endings, MD5 sums and all of the files are correct, but not to the point that the format within the file is normally correct. Nowadays, uh, we did implement recently uh, quality checks for sequence data, we, I don't think, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think we do it for the variants, the VCFs, but we do have uh, quality checks for uh, FASTQ files, BAM files, alignments, sequence data in general, in which you can check within our uh, website. If you click on one of the files, there is like a, an icon to the right that says like quality control, and then you can check what's within the file even before gaining access to it. Um, but we do not check even though we are improving, impro improving, sorry, improving our standards con continuously to get better quality data and metadata, we do not check to the point that we know exactly what is within each and every single file that we accept. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so next related question, which comes from, I think, the other side, from, from the research community side, that somebody is asking what scientific community can do to 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 generate uh, high quality public data which which can be submitted and can be used by uh, research community so i think it come it falls under uh, data management uh, category so i think i'll come to uh, deani for this question do you have some top tips or tools for data management how can people make sure that data is good and in the uh, yes uh, so to get to have a good data, you have to think about the data management from start. So the tips I would have would be first uh, make a data management plan. As I said, from the start, uh, there are tools out there to help you uh, to do that. Uh, so, for example, on the MP online, uh, we can I can share the link and um, uh, so on if you on the chat or data stewardship wizard also can help you with that. Um, also, uh, also uh, keeping attention to like versioning, 
uh, keeping, like getting rid of all like versions that uh, you no, long, no longer need. Uh, also making this available, like uh, you can use tools like GitHub or GitLab for that. Um, and uh, make sure your data is submitted to a uh, like data resource and that you use proper metadata uh, for that, like ontologies. You can find uh, all of this information uh, on how to do that in our uh, on the uh, tutorials that you uh, you had access and to go through before the webinar, because this uh, will when you after you get your data and you go to uh, submit that you'll be uh, asked for uh, quite some information that if you didn't um, work on gather all of this uh, throughout your like research, you might get in trouble to to get all of this ready. Uh, and don't try to do that just before your publication because you might really not uh, like manage to do that on time. So think from the start and and submit the data because the data resources, I think Marcus and Barrow can add to that. They really uh, can help you on by uh, by rolling out what you need to submit that data and to have a good quality data. So actually, if you do that from the start, you make sure you have good data because if the data is not good, you would be like notified that your data has a problem or you don't have. Um, like if there's metadata missing and so on. So yeah, these are uh, the main tips uh, for that. And to find out where to submit data, you can use the MVBI data submission wizard tool. And also you can use like firstsharing.org or re3data.org uh, to uh, find out where to submit your data. So I don't know if any of you would like to add anything. Right. Thanks, Jenny. Thank uh, you for the link. Uh, yeah, we also have a link in, in chat for the submission wizard. All right. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and for the next general question, I will um, come to Baron first. That how so so now we know why we should submit the data and uh, how data should be managed. Um, and uh, yeah, so how, we, how, you, how you maintain the quality. But the next question is how databases and data archives are, are maintained and updated regularly. Sorry. So the actual updating of the data itself, we communicate to the submitter at the stage of archival. A lot of the time we receive additional submissions from the same submitter um, just to say, well, you know, I've generated these variants, but um, I've generated them against a new assembly. And now I need to submit them, which they can either submit them as a new project or they can update the existing project they have in which they submit the new data under the existing project accession they have. It depends on how they're referencing their data. So as you've seen that when we archive data in the EVA, we provide this project accession number. And if they just want to reference that one project accession number in further publications or papers, then they can archive all their additional data sets under that same project accession. But then we also have instances where the submitter says, well, I've done this sort of run seven of this bull genomes project. I now have run eight, but I want to submit it as a completely new project because it's the way I've done the analysis is completely new. Um, they're free to do so. So in that sense, the sort of the maintenance and the updating of the data is done directly by the submitter. It's not down to us to update the data as things progress. But in saying that, we do attempt to, as you've seen, one of our roles is to provide these unique accessions to individual variants as well. So in that sense, we aim to ensure that these identifiers we're assigning, they need to be preserved as new technologies come out and um, 
we also have to remember that these identifiers have been being used um for years now it was previously the role was previously um uh the ncbr was previously responsible for this role and um with open access and fair data we're ensuring that <clears throat> we want to ensure that all data falls through the cracks but also the data when that it, that isn't falling through the cracks also is um of a of a this if it abides by fair data it's of a certain standard so in that sense, we do have a tool called the variant remapping tool, which essentially grabs um, any SS or RS IDs from older assemblies and maps them to newer assemblies. Um, we do this by essentially looking at the flanking sequence and just working out how the variant would look on the newer assembly. But we also have instances where we have these older RS IDs, one that may be assigned in 2008, and we had to look for the older associated information with that and we couldn't find it so we we still made this available to the public but we've put it in a separate file and said hey well this id is available but um it may be missing such information such as the associated reference sequence it was mapped against we i think it was an important decision that we didn't just make on a whim we actually um spoke to a number of different research consortiums and done a bit of outreach work to ensure, to essentially ask, well, we have these RSIDs that don't have the associated information, would they still be relevant to the research community? And we found the answer was yes, that we, again, it's part of the fair data policy that we don't want this data to end up going missing, but we need to sort of have um, a notice that there may be issues with the data or we, we, we there's no associated information. The variant remapping tool, attempts to ensure that um, the data we get today will be relevant. The, the ID that's assigned to a variant today can still be queryable in five years' time or 10 years' time. The identifiers we're providing sort of provide a footprint, and um, you should be able to track where the variant, how the variant was generated, when it was generated, and it's sort of how it's going through with the newer um, genome assemblies coming out. So that is one of the things we do. We do provide this sort of variant remapping to keep the identifiers updated. But for the actual data sets itself, those are down to the individual submitters. Right. Thanks, Darren. So now we'll move on to uh, some questions which are about uh, about using public data resources, how they can use it, how you, how you access it uh, for your research. So I'll start with the question uh, which will be for you, Marcus, is so is it possible to access data from clinical, clinical cohorts for general research purpose? Yes. Um, so this question has been divided into parts. So the first one is, can you access data from clinical cohorts? And that is yes, depending on the data that we have. So if we have data from clinical cohorts, you can access it. Only, and this is important as the EGA, only if you are given consent by the uh, data controllers, so, uh, which would be the data access committee. And now for the other part, which is for general uh, research purpose, that's related to the policy of each of these uh, data sets or studies. Uh, for instance, there is um, the ontology of data use ontology. Redundancy. The data use ontology or dual code um, has many, many codes for these different policies and these different uh, purposes for the re reusability of the data. One of them, is, if I remember correctly, it's the general research purpose. So if the policy of the study um, encompasses the general usage purpose, you can reuse it for that uh, matter. And now you just need for them to coexist for one of the studies to be a clinical cohort and to have that uh, part in the policy. But if, if they do, surely you, you can access, uh, gain access to it first and then reuse it in that matter. But I don't specifically know of all of the millions of data sets and studies that we, uh, that we archive. I don't know specifically if we contain one of these characteristics. I suppose we do, but I am not entirely sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the next uh, a bit related question is uh, that now these 
all these data are publicly available, but can I design a project in big data analysis uh, um, for creating my, my own project using publicly available data? And what are the issues that I need to uh, consider? So if I can start with Baron for this question. Uh, yes, um, the general answer is yes, you can. It's um, it's actually one of the projects I suggest. Um, uh, I also work within the training team at the EBI, and um, a lot of the time it's um, sort of users that are trying to go from um, get into bioinformatics and they want to familiarize themselves with different resources and tools. This is actually a very very good way to do that. In that um. I mean, when I was learning programming, actually, one of the first projects I done was um grab data from the sequence read archive and um make a pipeline to go from the uh, fastq files to VCF files. And um, I mean, the data I was using was real sample data from the a thousand um genomes project. And um, it's always good when you're working with sort of live data instead of dummy data. And it's um it was just a good way to analyze and see what different tools and softwares do. So there were a number of trial and error why I wasn't using the right software, I wasn't using the right tool, but um, that's a way that you can essentially grab, go onto the, simply go onto a open access database or resource, um, grab the data they publicly have available and then um, use it as you wish, um, create different pipelines with it. You'll actually see that there's various different resources um, resources or research teams that make different pipelines depending on the nature of the data they're working with. I know there's any um uh ancient 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 genomics lab down at um one of the um universities in London that um they have a um tool that essentially takes a look at so aims to take a look at divergence times between um using sequence data and they have they essentially make ensure that the sample data they're using is made available. So yeah, it's 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 fine to do so. I actually encourage that that's one of the um benefits of having open access data. We can also use it for research, but we can also use it for learning as well. Right. Thanks, Ben. Um okay, uh so the next question I think Barry... I can I can add a little bit uh, on top of what Byron said, um, because exactly what Byron said is what happens. Uh, you can indeed create, let's say, a layer that works with the archives so that you can download the data, analyze it, reuse it, and so on automatically and programmatically. And it's a very good um, idea, and that's what mainly uh, bioinformaticians do all over the world. Uh, but I, I do want to add, because as, again, as we are, a control access archive at the EGA, I do want to highlight that there is a small bottleneck. And when I say small, I mean big, a big bottleneck, which is the data access um, request. So for instance, you can build that huge layer or a small layer that interacts with the archives. But um, for you to use the data within the EGA, you have to be granted access. And for you to be granted access, the request has to go through us to the data controllers, which in, in this case are called uh, data access committees. And normally they don't provide access uh, programmatically. So it's a case by case, uh, normally a case by case um, access uh, granted. So in that, in, in that uh, case, you would need to have like that little window uh, of time between the uh, the request of access to the data and the actual usage of the data but over apart from that once you are given access it's just like any other um, archive thank you uh, and baron you mentioned pipelines in your answer so there was one question about what type of pipe pipelines can one use to analyze data from publicly available sources, and if there are no pipelines, how how do I create it? I mean, it's a, it's a good question. It's very broad in that um, it depends on what you're attempting to look at. There's a number of different pipelines. It depends what stage you're going from, if you're working from proteomics or genomics, or essentially it comes down to what you're attempting to look at. Um, 
if you're looking at a variation, you can make a variant calling pipeline using sample data, reference sequence, or if you're using any other type of pipeline, it literally depends on where you can grab the data from and what pipeline you can make. There are a couple of tools that aim to essentially go through the whole process, sort of the uh, central dogma process of going from um, the sequence level to the protein level, or there's pipelines that simply aim to just look at the variation level um side of things more often than not um i mean bioinformatics it's it's still sort of um not an early field but it's um still you'll still find that there's individual research teams that are working on individual things so if you are looking for something in particular the best thing to do is just do a simple google search you'll find that there has most likely been a tool that has been created or a pipeline that has been created in the same type of analysis you're attempting to do. And um, again, it goes back to ensuring that everything's open access in that hopefully that research teams made the um, the uh, tool open in that you can take a look at how they do it and um, sort of the tools and softwares they're also using and attempt to sort of create your own version of that as well. Great, thank you. Um, uh, and now there's a question which is specific to EGA. Um, so is there an open API way to query the EGA and federated EGA before and after gaining access to specific data sets? Yes. Um, well, the, the answer is a little bit more complicated because there is one metadata API uh, that you can use to, to get let's say a subset of the metadata that we that we archive because once again since it's on demand the the access it's um, user by user no no one can see the sensitive data that we hold unless you are granted access so the open api that we have for everyone even if you have, don't have access it, it just contains a subset of pseudo anonymized data so the 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 data you won't be able to make the linkage between the physical person and the data that, that you gain from this API because it's pseudo anonymized. But it's very useful in the sense that uh, normally when you do a query to these kind of APIs, you are, you're uh, looking for a specific phenotype or uh, sex or I don't know, age range and things like that. So even though the whole spectrum of uh, metadata fields, especially about the individual, are not displayed in the open API, there is one open API. Um, let me just share the link in the chat. And as I was saying, um, this is this uh, this API offers just this subset. Now, even though it is within our roadmap, we do not yet we do not have um, an authorization layer on top of that metadata API, in the sense that the same API cannot be used to um, gain to to uh, receive the metadata both from uh, an unauthorized user and both from that and the authorized user. So to gain the full set of metadata, there is another, another way that is not programmatically um, distributed at the moment. So even though we have an open API and you have access to a subset of data through that API, you won't be able to have through the same API the whole, uh, the whole uh, set of the metadata. Now, regarding the other part, which was, if I remember correctly, the federated EGA and how to access it. Um, so as I introduced during my uh, short introduction, the uh, EGA is expanding and different nodes are uh, being created all over the place. Now, these nodes will communicate with the central EGA and we will share metadata uh, with one another. And if you query their resource, you will be querying our resource as well and so on. So there will be communication between the two of us. Uh, but I say there will be because currently it's a little bit in the early stages. So the federated nodes are, are currently um, built. So there are a few that are already in production. They have different, um, different approaches for this problem. And it's a little bit in the early stages for me to say that there is a, a generic and um, a uh, generic API for this matter. I, we do not have it yet. It's in the earlier stages, right? Okay. 
Thanks, Marcus. So as we are talking about uh, uh, data access, there's again a specific question, I think it's for Marcus and Baron. Uh, is there a fast queue dump available for downloading genome assemblies? So um, the answer, the quick answer is no. If you, like if the FASTQ dump is meant to be from the SRA to the FASTQ, like the NCBI does, um, because we as data controllers, we do not modify the format of the data that we receive. So if the data was in FASTQ file, was a FASTQ file, we would be distributing a FASTQ file. Now, if the data was an SRA or a BAM file or whatever, we would be distributing the file in its original form. Um, now, if by FASTQ dump, you, uh, whoever asked the question means that um, there is a way to receive the FASTQ files from one of the of our archives in a programmatic way. There is, we have a data downloader that you can use and you can download the FASTQ files, but this is the caveat only if they were submitted as FASTQ files, because otherwise you would be downloading the original format. I don't know if these changes regarding the EVA, but that's for the EGA at least. Yeah, it's a, essentially the um, answer is no, there's not that much dump of um, <clears throat> uh, FASTQ, FASTA files. Um, we can only, we do provide the API, so you can access this sort of if you wanted to through the, um, command line, but um, again, it's whatever data we receive is whatever data is made publicly available. At the EVA, we only handle VCF data. So the only data you'll be able to query is VCF. But um, there are, I mean, such as one of our sister databases, the ENA, will they provide um, faster files or FASTQ files. It's, again, there's not exactly a bulk download you can do where you can just sort of access a single dump of all the uh, FOSC, um all the files they have, but um, as they also have a dedicated API, you could essentially build a query to hopefully automate this process and um, sort of download what you needed to through a list. Yeah, thanks, Baron. So now we are moving into uh, questions which are about spe specific data types or kind of data. Uh, and the first question, I think I'll come to uh, Dani for this. So yeah, so we have been we have been going through a pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic uh, for the last three years. We are still into it. So is there a free access data available from COVID-19 patients, Dan? Uh, uh, we can't hear you, Danny. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mute myself. Uh, you can access the COVID-19 patient data through the COVID-19 data portal, but that's human data, right? So there will be uh, some layers of authentication, uh, but uh, that you won't be able to access the data through the portal, but the portal will uh, provide the links to the uh, resource where you can request this data. Um, this data set, but any other data that's public uh, access, you will be able to access it directly because uh, in the COVID-19 data portal, we find uh, all the like the data on COVID-19, like the patients, patient data and also the COVID data. So uh, they just, the data go to different like hubs. So the COVID data goes to like the COVID data hub and then you can freely access that, but all the human data that uh, we get through EGA, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's under control. I don't know if Marcos wants to add anything to that. Yeah, basically there is a, a very handy and useful COVID-19 data portal, um, which indexes what we have as EGA. So basically, we, as an archive, someone uh, submits data to us and it's related to COVID-19. For it to be easily discovered, you can query, actually you can query within the EGA, but um, since the COVID was a primordial topic, let's say during the past two, two years, um, a COVID-19 data portal was created and that indexes what we have within the EGA so that it's easier for those that um, that are doing research about COVID-19, it's easier for them to find 
um, studies and data sets within the EGA that are related to that. Thanks, Marcus. And there's a link already in chat, you can see it's about uh, COVID-19 data portal. And we also have an online tutorial about uh, this, how to use that COVID-19 portal, which uh, we'll add link uh, very soon. Uh, so while I'm uh, with you, Danny, um, I'll ask you another question, which is about, I'm looking for a public GWAS or, or genetic data of diabetic patients. Could you suggest a useful database for that? muted again jewels uh, catalog uh, would be uh, i would say a good um, resource to go uh, for that um, and yeah uh, i think uh, they might be able to find uh, the date specific data in other data resources at pbi as well like eg right um, but uh, yeah so i don't know if uh, marcos uh, uh, wants to add, but I think they depending on the type on specific data, you can find it on other data resources as well. Yeah, I think that that's basically it, it depends um, what we are given. Like we, we cannot do miracles. It, it yeah. all depends uh, on what we are given as data controllers by these submitters. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so now while we're asking questions about specific data types, uh, so Marcus, it is, I think there's one question for you. Do you make RNA-seq data available um, as well with your resources uh, as how can I, how can I download them? Yes. Um, so once again, it all depends on what we are given. So uh, VGA does have um, a few RNA-seq. I, I don't actually know right now the number, but we have quite a few. And we do provide that data. Once again, if you are given access, but we do provide that data and allow you to, to download the data of the RNA seq. Once again, if that is what the submitters gave us to us, like it, it all depends to what they gave us. If, if they submitted an, an RNA seq uh, study or data set, but it's in another format or it's in a tab format or it's just sequences or it, it was pre-analyzed like raw data or it was analyzed and it, it has already the variants um, call it. It all depends on what, what we are given. We do have, as we said before, we do have some standards on all of the formats and different file combinations and, and the metadata and so on. But if they didn't provide us we, uh, the, the raw data of the RNA seeks. We won't be able to, to uh, distribute them because we don't have them. Now, if you like how to download it, it's just the same way as any other type of data that we hold. We have the download client. Let me just copy paste the, uh, the URL again. This URL is the uh, GitHub, so it's a little bit more technical. But it's um, it has the readme and documentation how you can uh, download it, clone the repository, install it, and use it. But if not, uh, you, there is also, if I remember correctly, it has to be within the egarchive.org, and it's download downloader quick access. This one. So this one is within our website itself, and it's more of a let's say generic spectrum of the of documentation. It's more broad. Um, but once again, both revolve around the downloader that we have. So rna seq data will be downloaded in the same way as VCFs or I don't know, Array Express data and things like that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, next question is for uh, Baron is about where data is coming from. So do you have human as well as bacterial data in EVA? Yes, we do. Um, at the moment, um, the majority of the data found in the EVA will be from human, but um, the ratio of human as opposed to any other species um, is sort of increasing in favor of any other species. Um, we actually sort of um, promote that if human data is coming into the EVA, we ensure that um, it's sort of open access, it's fine to be open access and come into the EVA. But we are 
also doing some outreach at the moment to non-human species communities, specifically the um, bacterial and viral communities. We have some data in our database from these communities at the moment, but um, we want to ensure that we receive more. Um, the more data we receive, the more use we have for these communities, the more useful we are to these communities. So yeah, we do have human and bacterial, but um, yeah, the majority of the data we're receiving at the moment is from non-human species. Okay, thanks a lot. So it's already half past uh, four years. It's been one hour for this webinar. So we are running out of time now. So there are many questions in the Q&A box which have been answered by typing in already. And you, you have several links in the chat, uh, which I'll also share you with the email, which I'll send uh, by tomorrow with the links uh, for the recording for, for this webinar. Um, yeah, so we probably can't take uh, many the questions from Q&A, but yeah, several questions have been answered already. Um, if I can take just one question um, more, uh, and it's for EGA, um, just asking if DNA methylation from human PBMCs, uh, are they published in EGA or should they be published in EGA? So the, the quick guide on is my data supposed to be submitted to EGA is, is it human related? As in, is it derived from humans? Because that's the, one of the main cutoffs um, in, in our case. And also, is it control access data? Because not all human data is control access data. I, I think for those that uh, already finished the webinar, you already know this distinction. But the personal data is not always sensitive, and not all human data is personal, and not all personal data is sensitive. So we as EGA only hold sensitive and human data. So if the if any time, not only the one included in this question, but if any type of data is derived from a human and contains sensitive metadata, which includes also um, genetic data, not only metadata or phenoclinical data, if it contains sensitive data, there is perhaps that case in the EGA. Now, I just like with the other types, I don't know exactly uh, all of the data that we hold because it's just millions and millions of data sets. But uh, you can actually query uh, with the keywords that you have within the EGA uh, archive website. I'm just going to copy paste it. So if you query within um, our search box uh, with your keywords, you should be able to find um, most, if not all, of your answers regarding different types of data being archived or not within the EGA. So with that, thank you again. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.